Okay, so with that, I'm just going to introduce Danny in a little bit more depth here before I hand over to him directly. So as mentioned, very pleased to have Daniel here today, who's joined us from Aston University. So Danny is a lecturer in politics and international relations. And I've got a bit of a biography on screen there for Danny and his background, which you can obviously have a quick read through. Uh, so Aston University are a customer of VVOX, and we've got a very good relationship with the university, and we've worked with them for a number of years now. And we actually ran some on-site training with the university towards the back end of last year. And Danny himself was actually present on one of those sessions and subsequently off the back of that actually got in touch with us to, to ask if he could present at one of these future uh, webinar sessions that we run. So obviously, Danny, we were only too pleased to accept your offer and, you know, so grateful and, and pleased to have you here today to obviously share your own experience and use cases of VBOX within your own teaching. So I think, Danny, if it's OK with yourself, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. So I'm just going to change the presenter here to yourself. Okay, yeah, so uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks, Afraida, for the introduction and, and the opportunity to kind of share some of my reflections and my practice. I'm kind of what I want to speak to people about over the next 20 minutes to 30 minutes is some of the kind of practical applications. I think Fraser and the rest of the VVOX team, they're much better placed than me to talk about the kind of the more technical aspects and the technical know how. This is really about kind of how I've used VVOX and applied it in my own in my own teaching. And I suppose that why have I done this? You know, why did I get why did I go to the training session initially and why did I follow that up with the, the offer to do one of these webinars? I think it's kind of motivated by kind of the old adage, if you really, you know, if you really want to to learn something properly, then you need to kind of teach it. So I'm not here as a an avowed expert and everything that VVOX has to offer. You know, I'm still kind of learning it, it's it's kind of its utility in, in teaching and its applications. But I wanted to kind of consolidate a little bit of my own implicit knowledge that I've built up over the last, certainly the last kind of two to three years uh, and kind of begin to kind of piece that together myself in a more systematic way. And then also hopefully in the kind of the question and answer session later, kind of learn what other people are doing to kind of help improve my own practice uh, further. So please already kind of give uh, kind of an overview of who I am. So yeah, I am a, a lecturer in politics and international relations at Aston University in Birmingham. Most of my research and teaching is framed around the state and changes within the state and theories of the state over time. And then one of my other specialisms is on the politics of sport or the intersection of, of sport and politics and and as i research and i and i actually teach modules on both of those uh, subjects in terms of my teaching experience kind of very quickly i've taught at three different universities in the uk sheffield manchester and now aston and i also before that so that i've kind of been teaching around about 10 or 12 years now in higher education before that i had a brief stint of teaching in high schools in the northwest of England, more specifically Bolton. And although that was a kind of a brief period, it was important and kind of formative in, in shaping my kind of teaching philosophy. So I suppose in many ways I do kind of begin with engagement whenever I'm planning my teaching and, and in many ways privilege that student's engagement over content. So I think that's kind of important to kind of stay from the outset because that that does frame and shape how i then plan my teaching including the use of vvox i want to kind of get students involved in the subject and, and interested in the subject to inspire them to kind of learn more about it and i want to also put the onus on students as much as possible to kind of do the work in the sessions so kind of following on from that kind of idea that the students as the producer of knowledge which is associated with Mike Neary. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of my kind of broad philosophy on, on teaching and learning. So the outline what I'm going to talk about today, say so I've mentioned it is on the kind of practical applications of VVOX to engage students. The context, what I'm going to focus on is on-campus face-to-face sessions. Now, of course, this is not the only ways in which VVOX can be used. And I have used it in other contexts, particularly in the online context, like webinars such as this. 
but increasingly I am using it more in the kind of the traditional face-to-face -face teachings on campus. And what I want to provide is some kind of really kind of practical examples of how I use it in my teaching. So what's being called in the literature kind of pollable moments. What are those moments in teaching sessions, in seminars, in on-campus sessions that you can kind of use VBOX and how can you use VBOX or how do I use VBOX? And then finally, I'll wrap up very quickly with kind of a brief run through of what I think are the key benefits and potential risks of using VBOX in this context. Okay, just a, a kind of a bit of a, a background. So I first came across the idea or the systems of audience polling about a decade ago when I was at the University of Manchester. And I remember attending a learning and teaching conference where there was an economics lecture, I think, kind of extolling the virtues of audience of audience polling in large group teaching sessions. So kind of talking here around approximately 500 students, I think this person was teaching to. And although I was kind of interested, when I began to do the cost benefit analysis of this, I thought, well, what are the benefits of having a few closed questions versus what seem to be the costs particularly the logistical costs of ordering hundreds of clickers, distributing those hundreds of clickers within class and collecting them in. And at the time I thought it's probably just not worth it. It, it doesn't quite fit in. It seems a good idea, but it doesn't quite fit into A, particularly the learning outcomes I have for that module, which were more about the development of critical thinking rather than the kind of accumulation of kind of objective facts or particular bits of knowledge. And it, it kind of it just it just didn't kind of seem to fit with what I wanted to do in the end. So for a lot for a few years after that, I tended to think about these audience polling systems closely associated with those very very large kind of lecture settings. I think over time and very much sporadically, I began to kind of experiment with different types of software um so padlet kahoot as well as as vvox but vvox is probably the one i kind of came back to more often than not because it, i found it kind of be the easiest to use and, and apply to what i wanted to do but generally they say this was kind of sporadic i wasn't kind of doing it in any kind of systematic way i was kind of dropping things in almost to kind of add variety to sessions in, in many cases and kind of keep myself as much as the students kind of you know on my toes so to speak and then it was only really during the pandemic in terms of moving my teaching online and then kind of incrementally moving it back offline into the classroom that i began to think more systematically about how i could use vvox and, and in particular repurpose and adapt the things that had worked well in webinars online back into, into the classroom. because So that's kind of the point I've been at for the last, I suppose, 18 months to, to kind of two years. So at this point, what I'd like to do, I'd like to just kind of begin, and what I often kind of try and do is begin with a, a, a poll, and that should say word cloud, not world cloud, word cloud in the VBOX session. So I'm gonna navigate kind of out of this for a moment. So. As I say, one of the, the key theme running throughout this is student engagement. But I'd like us to kind of take a couple of minutes to pause and kind of reflect on what do we actually mean by that? When we, you know, we're often talking about, you know, the need to engage students in their learning. But what do we actually mean by student engagement? So this is a chance for you to kind of give your thoughts and reflections on what that phrase means to you. Okay, I'm about to close now. Okay, so lot, lots of answers there, and obviously, kind of, you know, far too many of us to kind of unpick during this sort of session. Kind of most popular one being participation, kind of participation in their learning or active participation, responding, listening, interaction. So we've got kind of lots of kind of synonyms for kind of engagement. The reason I kind of want you to do that exercise as well as kind of showcasing how can you can use kind of word clouds to begin a session towards the beginning of a session is really to encourage people to take a step back 
and think about okay when they are using something like vbox to engage their students what is the real purpose of it now i think most of the time implicitly when we're thinking about students engagement we are thinking about it from a kind of cognitive point of view um we're thinking about how to engage students to help them in their acquisition of knowledge understanding of skills but there are other learning domains and in many ways this is the kind of the other taxonomy that goes alongside bloom's taxonomy so there are other learning domains which are important and which relate directly to engagement that we need also to think about and think about when we are designing these types of activities within vbox so yeah certainly cognitive is going to be really really relevant and uh, applicable to lots of circumstances but you also have kind of effective engagement so getting students to think about or reflect on their feelings emotions and attitudes now this is something i have done particularly in relation to my introductory modules to politics to try and impress on students and get students to recognize that politics is an activity is a practice that is done out there in the real world and people care about as well as a scholarly subject that we learn about in their degree program and it's obviously really really relevant to when we're thinking about things such as learning community and developing that sense of belonging within the university within higher education and within the, the kind of cohort the last learning domain and way to engage students is the kind of the psychomotor the kind of the more physical or performative aspects of learning now this is obviously really relevant to certain disciplines medicine music sport anything you know engineering that involves lab work but i think it probably does cut across the disciplines more than we we actually realize because if we think about psychomotor engagement or learning about converting learned responses into habitual actions well something like good academic practice you know proper referencing is a learned response you know and hopefully will become a habitual action uh, in students and again that is something else you can use these engagement activities within vbox to develop so i think it's important think about what you are using vbox for in terms of your goals of engagement before you begin so the, the context that I'm going to talk about and where my experience really lies now is in this kind of blended learning format. And most of my teaching now resides in this kind of middle ground, you know, this kind of this kind of middle area of it's not really small group teaching, you know, in a kind of a typical seminar style format of you know, a really small number of students, i.e., kind of about, you know, anything up to 12 most of the groups i now teach are somewhere between 12 and kind of 50 students and i generally are asked them teach in two hour blocks most of our teaching is timetabled in that way and there's an expectation in this blended learning environment that these two hours are interactive rather than didactic so this is kind of where i'm kind of using and applying vbox most often and the distinction between, uh, in the title of this session, between whole class and small group teaching really kind of gets to the heart of this. Because I think sometimes, going back to kind of my own preconceptions uh, about audience polling, sometimes there's a tendency to, um, to lead to kind of the individuation of engagement, i.e. students are responding to questions you know, individually um, and what I want to do is try and mitigate that tendency as much as possible and encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning. So when I talk about whole class engagement, I'm talking about individual students individually responding and the kind of the small group is kind of small group learning, peer-to-peer -peer type learning going on. So that's the context. Quickly run through what are or what I see as the pollable moments. Well, I think there's certainly an opportunity for pre-class polling before students arrive, and this will be kind of whole class individual responses. Often this is done to kind of capture prior learning, what students know. I'm going to kind of set out two other examples that I have used, one around setting expectations and another around integrating student choice into the curriculum. 
The other kind of, one of the key applications I use are particularly around starters. I also use it for icebreakers, but I'm not gonna focus on that today. But I'm gonna also look at how to use starters for kind of pre and post discussion within seminars. Explicitly look at how VBOT can be applied to small group work. Also kind of a subset or another example of that is comparative polling, where I take a poll of the students in the room and then get them to analyze the responses against a poll of a wider population, you know, you know the UK public, for example. Assessment for learning, kind of checking students' understanding, and then questioning, which I most often use in the middle of the session as a kind of a natural break in a two-hour session. So pre-class polling, one of the things I've used this for is to kind of manage and set expectations. And actually where I've used it most often is not in relation to teaching, it's actually been in relation to the supervision of dissertation students. So usually our supervisory period begins with a group session of supervisees. And before that session, or at, the, at least at the very beginning of that session, I provide kind of four to five questions through VVox where I get students to respond to different questions about what they expect or what they think that supervision process is going to be like, or is going to look like. So this is an example. Question one, is it the supervisor which decides a theoretical framework or methodology that is most appropriate? And there's only four students in this session, but we can see that one of those, 25%, strongly agrees. So that's really useful for me to kind of see where the level of students' understanding of that supervision process is and allow me to kind of correct or remedy maybe some of their misconceptions at the very beginning. So again, this could be, could be used to a whole range of different types of, of teaching or supervisory or, or academic uh, contexts where it's important to kind of understand and kind of gain a level of understanding between the instructor or the supervisor in this case and the students. The other kind of pre-class polling that I, I regularly use is to kind of integrate student choice in the curriculum. So this is a poll taken my, from my final year sport and politics module. And in that module, I have generally left a week free towards the end um, where students can, can vote kind of in the couple of weeks running up to that session on what topic they would like to cover. It can be a topic we've already covered or it can be a topic that we're, which we haven't managed to kind of fit in. So this is good because it builds some flexibility. It means I don't have to discard topics entirely as new things inevitably come up, but I can I'll kind of continue to build them in through this application of student choice. Um, so students can new learn, learn a new topic, they can go over an old topic that was they think is particularly important, or they can have more uh, focus on assessments. So again, quite a quick and easy way to kind of build in that student choice into the curriculum. As we've seen ourselves earlier, we can use VVox for started activities. Word Cloud is probably the thing I've used most frequently over the last few years. I find them um, really, really useful because it sets the tone for the session. It sets my expectation that students will participate from the very, very outset. I also like it because it's a really good departure point for discussion. So with this one, what words or phrases do you associate with politics? It doesn't really matter. And actually sometimes it's quite useful if I get, not necessarily wrong, but if I get kind of strange left field answers or things aren't included, omissions are really, really good. Because that gives me then the departure points to kind of address that they haven't thought of something or they've, they've tended not to kind of respond with that word as often as other ones. This is good because it means I can plan in what is the key message for that session without just kind of saying that in a very kind of explicit sense from, from the from the word go. 
So it gives me an entry point through participation to communicate what I think is the most important thing students should grasp. Now, if they identify that within the Word Cloud activity, that's brilliant. If they don't, I've got an opportunity to kind of get that point across. So in the same way with the engagement, engagement was the key theme for this session. I gave you an opportunity to respond with what you thought engagement was. And then I basically said, this, these are the kind of the three level framework of engagement, which I think is important for you to, to kind of take away and think about when you are planning your activities and your applications at VBOX. So I feel it's a nice route in, I think, to, to sessions via students' participation. The other application I use VBOX for in terms of started activities is visual stimuli. Now, this is good for kind of post discussion. So I give the visual stimuli first, and then I allow students the opportunity to discuss that stimuli, and then they respond, and it can be response individually or as a group to a question. So this one is an activity I use in a seminar on globalization. So the visual stimuli is a short clip of the film in Bruges, which is one of my favorite films. And I asked this question, why is it in Bruges and not in Antwerp? And I give them some context for this. And what I want to discuss in the group is explaining one paragraph, what caused Bruges to be such a different place visually, culturally from Antwerp. So to give you a little bit of context, here's a picture of Bruges, which gives the students, here's a picture of Antwerp. And the, the premise of the question is kind of taken from Tim Harford's book, The Undercover Economist. And in short, the answer is globalization is the reason. In the 15th century, the River Sieve in Bruges silted up, which kind of preserved its Gothic architecture, trade shifted to Antwerp, Antwerp, therefore, looks very, very different from Bruges. So, in other words, globalization affects the built environment. It affects how the world looks around us. So, th this is really good because, as I say, VVOX, in that sense, is just the way of capturing the answers. The activity is not in itself VVOX, the activity is the discussion and the visual st stimuli, but it's a way to kind of pull those answers out of students. Okay, I am going to ask you to do this poll. So, simple question, are you a member of a political party, yes or no? I'll give you a minute to answer this one, should be relatively straightforward. So, we can see snapshots of this group who attended this session, vast majority, kind of over 86% of people aren't a, a member of a political party, the vast majority are under 15 percent. This is a, an example of a comparative poll, what I've called a comparative poll, that I use in my teaching, particularly first year teaching on politics, where we look at political participation. So I ask students the same question, I ask them a series of questions, are they a member of a political party and other aspects of political participation? And then I get them to compare the data from that group, from them as a group of students, to the broader kind of UK wide data. And then we analyze the differences between that and we kind of begin to explore what can be the explanations for that. Now we know one of the actual big dividing lines in UK politics now is education in terms of how people participate and also how people vote. So it's interesting because it, it enables students to analyze that broader data, but also think about it, their position in relation to it. So again, there could be lots of different applications of these comparative polls, which are engaging because they get the students to think about themselves, but also to do that kind of cognitive analytical work in terms of the comparison of that. And it, it begins to kind of help students understand kind of trends over time. And again, their place in relation to, the, to those trends. So very, very quickly, I've mentioned small group work, and this again is something I've begun to use uh, VVOX much more extensively for. So getting students into groups, small groups of three, four, five, setting them with a task, and then asking them to submit their answers or submit their work into a text-based poll. 
So this is an example where I wanted students to provide questions, questions on a topic, and these were kind of wicked problems, the wicked problem of fast fashion and the wicked problem of border security, which is topical today, for their own research project. The benefits, I think, of using VVOX in this way is that it adds accountability. I can see which groups have done it, but it's also efficient in the sense that it makes kind of plenary group feedback much quicker and much more effective. I'm not having to go around each group while they kind of give me their answer orally, which can take a long, long time. I can see what groups have done what, and then we can pick out and explore what we think are the most interesting aspects of that. So I think it's a really efficient way to organize small group work. Assessment for learning, you know, this is something maybe other people have used, quite a common way of using something like VVOX. It's a kind of a, a check on knowledge and understanding. You can do it at the beginning of a session as a recap in the middle for that session, at the end of a semester. You can be used in lots of different ways. Students like it, it's immediate feedback. So it, it's kind of, I think it's really, really popular and it helps the lecturer understand what are the knowledge gaps and identify those knowledge gaps. Questioning, which we'll finish on in terms of the applications. Again, lots of different applications. One way I have used this in my own teaching, where say I'm teaching in two hour blocks, is to say to students at the beginning of the session, the question and answer part of the VVOX session is open. And I insist on you know, getting at least two quality questions about the topic. So not assessment questions, not questions that can be found in the handbook, questions about what we are learning that day. I'll insist on getting two questions before we can go for a break. So this idea of kind of, I came across as, as questions as exit tickets does seem to work and does seem to kind of draw those questions out of students. So to kind of wrap up briefly, what are the benefits that I see for, for VVOX in my teaching? I think it's it's ease of use. It is easy to use for both instructors and for students. I've never really had any particular barriers in terms of students' lack of understanding or resistance to using VVOX. It does seem to kind of go with the kind of the grain of human nature in the sense that students are using their phones in particular all the time. So they don't seem to kind of resist or mind using that for teaching purposes. It's adaptable, and this is something, again, with that kind of repurposing idea I mentioned at the start. It's been useful for me to use VVOX to work through and update my teaching material to say, well, this worked in a webinar, or this worked in the past. How can I use this and apply it in the VVOX kind of context? And a kind of a really useful way to kind of update activities and, and often kind of make them more easier for me to kind of to run. It's efficient, as I mentioned, in terms of that small group work, it kind of makes group feedback and that kind of plenary part of seminars generally easier and much quicker. And in fact, what I've begun to do sometimes is actually use VVOX as a framework. So if I've got three to four polls in a session, what I've found is I don't really need to use PowerPoint as a structure. I can just use VVOX and kind of intersperse the other points with kind of lecture material or kind of teacher talk in between those polls. The risks, I think these are potential risks that I think they can be mitigated. Obviously you're reliant on technology um, and connectivity. Uh, again, I think this is more of a theoretical risk than in, than in practice. I haven't generally come across that technological obstacle. Obviously if you are teaching in the context where you cannot rely that students will have a you know a, a smartphone to use that is going to be that is going to be a barrier but again in my experience that hasn't been a problem uh, connectivity again you do you know need to have a wireless connectivity or students need to have you know mobile connectivity again it's not something i have faced many problems with there is a risk i think to individualized engagement and individualized focus um but for the ways I've outlined, I think that can be mitigated and worked around. And the other one is, is overuse like anything. The more you use something, the more you become familiar with it, habit forms, and there is a tendency to use it more and more 
even when it might not be appropriate. So again, be mindful of kind of why you are kind of engaging students in the first place and kind of think about and reflect on is VVox the most appropriate tool to do that? Okay, so that brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. I will pass over back to Fraser now and I kind of look forward to kind of hearing any questions or comments uh, that people have. Thank you very much, Danny. That was uh, that was fantastic. I'm just going to share my screen here. From my side, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I think for ourselves, it's always so enlightening to hear the sort of feedback and use cases from someone like yourself, Danny, who is actually in the trenches, you know, day to day with VVox, because obviously for myself and, and my colleagues, you know, we can obviously teach the, the practical applications of, of VVox and, you know, the technical elements aside, but actually kind of hearing those methodologies of the implementation of the platform and really almost using VVox as a vessel and a catalyst to draw out those conversations is, is always so interesting for us and, and, and really kind of the focus of, of what the platform is really all about. So I really enjoyed your talk there. And again, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Just a couple of quick bits, folks, before we move on to some questions that have been a few within the Q&A, so we'll have a look at those in just a second. But I just wanted to spend a bit of time to advertise our YouTube channel here. So if you're not familiar, uh, we do have a YouTube channel that you can access really easily by simply typing in VBOX onto YouTube and that will take you to our channel. We're pretty regularly active on there. So we post very regular videos and content, a bit of a mixed bag between functional videos. So around technical applications of the platform, tips and tricks and that kind of thing. But also all of our webinar series, such as the one we're posting today, will be hosted on there as well as a whole range of other content as well. So if you haven't seen that, guys, do please head over there and uh, check it out. There's lots of content for you to, to have a look through. And as well as that, we also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to on our website as well. So that's a very simple case of just navigating to the main VVox page. And at the bottom, you'll find a button where you can subscribe to the newsletter. And that will just keep you informed on the latest kind of functional updates and, and functionality coming to the platform, as well as different bits around the platform that we want to keep, obviously, everyone in the loop on. But with that, Danny, if it's okay with yourself, I think we'll have a look at the Q&A as there have been a few questions coming into the, uh, the Q&A board. So I'm just going to pull that up now. I'm filtering these by most liked. So essentially the order that they've been rated in. So starting off with this first one. So someone's posted here, how much of your use of VVox is to focus on asynchronous activity? So I guess kind of you know, the split between utilizing the asynchronous functionality, particularly like with the surveys. I know you actually had a few examples of that there in your own in your own presentation, Danny. But um, yeah, what does that sort of look like for yourself? Yeah, I think it's not extensive in my case. So I think it is more about that kind of pre-class polling. So yeah, sometimes prior learning, I've tried to ask questions. What I find though sometimes with that is it's difficult for students to kind of articulate what they don't know before they've begun the learning process. So I found that to be quite limited. Certainly in terms of the other aspects, setting expectations, kind of getting a sense of that. I think that is really useful. One, it's because it's anonymous. Students, I think students are quite honest with, the, with those quite questions. And also kind of building in that student's choice. In terms of the asynchronous activity, in a more purely cognitive, you know, more traditional learning sense. I don't I don't really use VVox, I must admit, that that much anymore. It it does tend to be more than those kind of live synchronous sessions. Sure. And that again, that's probably something where I could think a bit more about, about how I could build that in. So if people have got suggestions about what they do in the kind of asynchronous environments and what they find useful, then yeah, you know, I'd be interested to kind of hear more. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that, Daniel. I think it very much depends on, you know, potentially what it is that you teach and, and the faculty that you sit within, depending on how you make use of that functionality. I think some people find that the asynchronous functionality can almost help frame future mm -hmm. sessions because they can take the feedback survey based on a previous you know, class, for example. And then from that, you can kind of evaluate the content and actually work out you know, how much has really resonated with the students. So there are mm -hmm. applications from that side of things, but also you know, from a, from a functional learning uh, point of view as well. But uh, yeah, thank you for that question and for sharing your thoughts, Danny. Another one here. So do you run your sessions in an identified fashion or anonymous? So I know you pretty much just kind of answered that one there in your in your previous answer but did you want to touch upon that one anymore did you ever kind of yeah, find yourself yeah the kind of default is kind of anonymous and I don't I don't ever yeah. change that so it, it is always anonymous but really when you're doing 
when I kind of mentioned the small group work, it, it's effectively de anonymized because I, sometimes I ask groups to kind of say, well, you know, we've got four groups, you know, write your answer, this is group one. So then I've got that accountability. So I know that this group, and I may might have given responsibility for one person in that group to respond, I effectively know who it is. So it's anonymous right. within Vbox, but for, in the context of the session, it, it's not anonymous. And so sure. yeah, I don't I don't change it in terms of the settings within Vbox itself. I don't de-anonymize that in any way. Okay, yeah, that's great, Danny. I, I think you know a very kind of typical answer with, with what we're used to hearing in, in in that respect. I think you know. I would probably hazard a guess that over 95% of VVOX usage in academia is run in an anonymous setting purely for, you know, the empowerment that that anonymous environment gives and obviously, you know, allowing the students to feel a bit more comfortable and obviously, you know, kind of stripping that that potential stigmatism that could be associated with, you know, tying yourself to a response. So, yeah, very much yeah. Um, along but the I lines think it's, of... I think, yeah, it's, it, it, there is a balance there to be struck between... Sure. Anonymity, but sometimes I say, especially when you're getting students on a task, you want that accountability as well. And, you know, by getting students to submit as a group, that does at least provide that level of accountability that if you know if you've got four <laughs> groups and you've only got three responses, you know one group hasn't done it, and then you can go and ask why they haven't done it, you know. So so I think, yeah, there's a balance to be stuck between anonymity and accountability, yeah, in terms of teaching and learning. I think sure. I think just to add to that a bit further as well, you know, also from a point of view in that it kind of depends a little bit with, with what you're doing. You know, there may be scenarios where if you're running certain types of assessments that actually, you know, having that level of identification is, is actually quite useful. And there is a method by which you can run VVOX so that on the face of it, the students are anonymous. So as in this setting um, that we are right now, but in the backend data report that you can download from the platform, the students are identifiable. And that can be really good for being able to provide things like individualized and, and personalized feedback. You know, if you are kind of spotting trends amongst that data, you could potentially use that as a catalyst to then actually have conversations with those students. So, you know, you you kind of have the best of both worlds, really. But, you know, ultimately, the, the point is that it's always in your control, ultimately. But, uh, yeah, really appreciate your answer on that, Danny. And, and thank you for the question. So someone's posted here, have you found any issues with getting students to focus back on a lecture after you've finished with the question? Mm -hmm. Quite an interesting one, actually, Danny. I guess, but obviously, the whole point of VVOX is kind of, you know, inducing that level of engagement. But in terms of refocusing the students back onto the content after, what's kind of your experience been with that? Yeah, yeah, it's a strange one. That yeah, I suppose because because we're now in this kind of blended approach, our on-campus sessions they shouldn't really be lectures as, as such. Obviously, in a two-hour two-hour seminar. There are components <laughs> which resemble a lecture, but you know, I suppose I wouldn't distinguish. Vvox is part of the content. Vvox sure. is part of the learning. So it's not purely. There are obviously some questions where I might, I might kind of pose a question which is a bit left field or a bit esoteric, which is just about really kind of capturing students' attention or getting them to think about a subject. But most of the things I do try and make as relevant to what we're learning anyway. So yeah, there's not really the distinction between switching from VVOX back to the actual learning uh, as such, you know, as far as I can make it. So yeah, that's not that it's quite natural not, in your in your case. Yeah, that's not particularly a problem. Yeah. So to again to give okay. the example of the word cloud, I use that because I know. It might throw up something interesting, which we can explore in a bit more detail. But I, I, I know I can follow up with, with what I've planned to say. So there'll be always be a key thing, key bit of information I want to communicate, you know, at the beginning of a session to students. And the way cloud provides me a way of doing that, but by starting yeah. a group student participation. So if these, if you know, if, if what they respond resonates with what I want to say, then brilliant. I can reinforce that. But actually, when they don't, that is equally, if not, you know, sometimes it's better if they don't, because then I can really pick that up and hammer it home. So, yeah, I see the two things as acting in conjunction rather than kind of, you know, switching between the two, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure, Danny. I, I think I think it's an interesting question. And I think maybe the thought process behind that is, 
I've certainly had scenarios before where I've had the question around, you know, obviously if students are engaging and looking at their phone, obviously to answer the VBOX question, you know, whatever it is that, that we're doing at that particular time, yeah. is there potential risk of their attention going astray because they're then looking at other things or, or being distracted? Yeah, I suppose there is that kind of, you know, you've got students looking at their phone screen, how then do you pull them back to the yeah. listen to you? Yeah. To be honest, yeah, I'm not saying every student automatically puts down their phone and re-engages their interest, but it's certainly not more so in my experience, you know, sure. what what I'm kind of observing. I think as well, Danny, I'd say that part of that potentially is around also just kind of cementing that behaviour, kind of knowing mm. the VVOX polls are being introduced and then obviously it's it's kind of you know, reinforcing that engagement and then getting the students focusing on that. And then yeah. actually kind of seeing that over time, over a period of several kind of classes, that the students will kind of get used to that level of, of interaction, almost have that expectation of, oh, you know, Danny, where's the where's the VBOX today? But oh, I've certainly had that sort of uh, correspondence before. So yeah, again, really interesting question and certainly one uh, that we can obviously talk about further in in future. Someone's asked, even though you're running in-person sessions, you run the slides through VBOX rather than mm. through PowerPoint. Yeah, so that that's what I've tended to do. I have I have experimented with the kind of using the VBOX plugin and do it within PowerPoint. My personal preference is to switch between the two. So yeah, I, I think, and I know that the, the VBOX plugin is changing and it has more functionality, but the previous thing version didn't have all the functionality. I actually prefer when I'm delivering the sessions to switch between the two. That, I think that kind of helps me in a strange way rather than having okay. everything, everything within PowerPoints. But yeah, I know I know other people kind of use the plugin and, and do everything within within the slides. But I, yeah, I don't I don't know what students' preferences and I've not I've never asked them, so it'd be interesting sure. to see other people's experiences. Yeah, I think I think from my point of view, Danny, it's always an interesting one because really there's no right or wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. So wh whether you're choosing to run your polls and, and your questions directly through, um, you know, through PowerPoint or versus the present view as you've been doing today, obviously, hopefully the audience have seen that actually you can do it in that fashion in alt tab between the two very seamlessly, almost so you don't even know it's, it's kind of happening. Yeah. So it's really down to the user with what you're most comfortable with, what makes the most sense for your particular case. There are pros and cons to both, or, or should I say benefits to, to both, obviously running those polls directly from PowerPoint, encompassing that kind of uniformity and that you can mm -hmm. um, go through all of your content and it's all kind of rare uh, there in front of you. But also we actually have two versions of our PowerPoint add-in as well. I know you just alluded to that there, Danny. So. For those that aren't familiar, we have a beta add-in as well, which is kind of building upon the previous functionality of the existing add-in even further to encompass more polling types, as well as an integration directly with the 365 environment. So that is also something that we are actively kind of building upon in terms of functionality as well over the time. But yeah, in, in a nutshell, there is no right or wrong answer between the two. I, for, my advice would be to, to everybody who kind of is pondering that same kind of question is to really just play with both. Yeah, th doing this, is, it was interesting, going back and teaching in a webinar where you can't see the audience, it, yeah, <laughs> it probably does feel a bit more jarring to switch between the two. Sure, I think yeah. When I'm teaching, yeah, I suppose, that, you know, the slight messiness, that, that just doesn't seem to be an issue. It doesn't phase me when I'm teaching live. But I think when you're teaching a webinar that's fully online, it probably would look better and run better if it was in PowerPoint. But again, the kind of the switching process, I think in the live classroom environment, it, it certainly isn't an issue for me. So again, it's probably the contrast between webinar, online teaching and kind of live face-to-face -face teaching. I yeah. think it's quite different. I mean, I guess with the PowerPoint add-in, it does the hard work for you to, mm. to tap onto that. You know, you are able to just run through your slides as if it were a normal presentation. You can run the question, obviously gauge the responses, mm. show the results, have a discussion about it, move on to the next question. You know, it's it's very much a, a seamless experience, which is what the PowerPoint add-in is trying to capitalize on. Whereas obviously the present view here will give you that same experience, but obviously 
you know, it is kind of putting that responsibility on you to obviously have to move between the two. But yeah, it, it is ultimately down to personal preference. Thank you very much for for that, Danny. Again, really interesting thoughts there from, from yourself. I think, guys, just because we are a little bit over on time now, we will end the session there. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for, for getting involved on today's session with all the questions and also on those polls as well that Danny ran earlier. And again, from myself and behalf of the VVOX team, just a really big thank you, Danny, for kind of giving up your time today and, and coming along to run this with ourselves it's been really interesting um, hopefully everyone else has felt the same please do obviously come and visit us on the youtube channel as mentioned earlier guys and obviously if anyone does have any follow-up questions to any of this feel free to get in touch with us at vbox and obviously we will support you with whatever it is that you need but with that guys i'm going to end this there I'll say a big thank you once again thank you danny to yourself and i hope to see you all again on the next one